Good evening. Welcome to DC Math Ignite 3. I know there are some metro issues, uh, not surprisingly, and so we might have a late arriving crowd. Uh, it's great to see so many supporters of math education in the same room. Some people have been to a DC Math Ignite before, and some people who are here for the first time. Tonight is all about coming together to share ideas about the profession we love and that we're continuing to try to get better, uh, educating our students in mathematics. You all are here tonight because you love teaching and are eager to bring new ideas to your classroom and bring your classroom to the next level. Our presenters, an outstanding group, are here tonight for the same reason, and they just want to share their reflections on the journey they've been in as they try to improve their classrooms and teaching kids math. Uh, before we get started for the evening, we want to send a big thank you to Math for America DC, Math for America, and the Carnegie Institution for Science. This is the first presentation in this newly renovated, beautiful auditorium. So a big thank you to them for uh, letting us use this space. We have Maxine Singer here, who has been incredibly influential in advocating for STEM education in DC and helping bring Math for America uh, to DC. Um, before we get started tonight, if you haven't been to an Ignite event before, either here in DC or at an NCTM national or regional conference, it's a really straightforward idea. Each presenter gets five minutes to present one idea. They get 20 PowerPoint slides, 15 seconds each. They auto forward, so you, it's going to be fast. And they, the, oftentimes, the best advice is don't rehearse. And so if you see them catching on the words here, we are going to be a generous crowd because it is tough to get up here and present, uh, certainly. The goal of the event is so that you can get an idea to take home with you. A wise person once told me the only way to exceed expectations is to set low expectations. So we have eight talks, and we are trying to get one idea to walk away with tonight. And so that's our goal uh, as you go through this. Um, it is a storytelling tradition when people uh, share stories is to ask them the same question. So we asked each of our presenters tonight, we said, if you had a teaching superpower, what would it be? And so to start tonight, part of our event is so that we meet educators from across the city. If you could turn to somebody that you, maybe you don't know or have recently met, introduce yourself and tell them what would your teaching superpower be. Take a moment to introduce yourselves. All right, thank you guys for diving right in and starting to share some ideas. Okay, we hope that this presentation tonight is coming at a, at a good time heading into the Labor Day weekend. We all know we have grand aspirations for the summer and we're gonna get so much planning done and then summer happens and we stop, stop the planning process. And oftentimes the best thing to recharge the planning process is sitting through some mind-numbing PD at school as we get back into the swing of things and you start to think, all right, now I'm ready to work. And so we hope that you take this Labor Day weekend, um, that you can use some of these ideas to recharge your classroom. The only other thing I didn't mention is that in between talks, we're gonna be handing out some fabulous prizes. We spare no expense here at MFADC, literally very little expense for these prizes. <laughs> and so you are gonna have some prizes for you to take home and if you don't win it, you can go buy it for less than $8. That is our most expensive prize this evening. All right, without further ado, we're gonna get into our talks. Our first brave presenter tonight uh, is Julia Penn from Capital City Public Charter School. Julia not only is presenting tonight, Julia is the designer of all of our DC Math Ignite graphics. And so thank you, Julia, for all your hard work. All right. When asked what her teacher superpower would be, Julia said to clone myself for when I need a sub and I will be out sick. That is a very noble superpower to have. Julia's talk is titled The One Thing I'm Changing in My Classroom This Year. Let's have a warm round, warm round of applause for Julia. Hi everyone, is this a good volume? Yeah? yeah? Okay, cool. So, like Will said, this was really hard and I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> All right. So, last January, I began thinking about what every teacher thinks about in the winter time. Where should I go on my summer vacation? And I found myself faced with a decision. Uh, should I go on a trip to Italy and Greece with my boyfriend or should I go to math camp, and I chose math camp. And I spent three weeks this summer at the Park City Mathematics Institute, PCMI, 
with 45 other math teachers from across the country. And that's me marching in the 4th of July parade in Park City, Utah. Um, so quick plug, there are three parts to PCMI. Reflection in practice, where we actually just do math. Reflection on practice, which is more like a traditional teacher PD. And working groups, where we create PD materials on a specific topic of focus. So in reflection on practice, our teachers shared with us a quote that really resonated with me. Research on cooperative learning is one of the greatest success stories in the history of educational resource. Research, the greatest success stories. So this brings me to the one thing I'm changing in my classroom this year, which is group work. And by group work, I don't mean sticking four kids around a table and telling them to work together. I'm talking about intentionally teaching group work norms and roles. So at my PCMI working group this summer, our starting off point was to investigate strategies to help students engage in problem-based learning. And group work emerged as an essential tool to promote student collaboration in the problem-solving process. Um, so there's this teamwork dream that our powers combined and we'll literally become a superhero and save the world, or on a smaller scale, have students do rigorous tasks in a mathematics classroom. But the reality is not quite that, okay? The reality is their students are staring blankly at each other and waiting for us to come over and help them, or they're looking to the smart kid in their group and they're like, tell us what to do. So why can't we have this Captain Planet dream? It's because of status. Status is the perception of students' academic capability and social desirability. I'm gonna let that sink in. So what this looks like in my classroom is it's the student who always knows the answer, never makes mistakes, and always finishes first. And the other students look to that student for the right answer and value their opinion and ideas over others in the class. And no one is looking to the Bart Simpsons in the class for any answers. To see how status plays out in your classroom, you could get a coworker to observe your class and record who speaks and who doesn't, whose ideas are listened to and whose are brushed past. So here's the thing, speed and precision aren't the only abilities that are useful in problem solving. Every student has different mathematical competencies, and without all strengths, students will be limited in their own problem solving abilities. The norms listed here, I know it's a lot, there's two slides worth of them. I mean, it's the same slide twice, okay? So we're gonna be okay. So, no talking outside your group. Helping does not mean giving answers. No one is done until everyone is done. You have the right to ask for help and the responsibility to help. Call the teacher for group questions only. Talk and listen equally. And most importantly, no one of us alone is as smart as all of us together. And that's really getting back to this Captain Planet idea that really we want to shift students' mindsets into believing that they all have something valuable to contribute within a group and our powers combined, you know, next slide, okay, great. All right, um, so this may sound crazy, but to equalize status, you really should group students randomly. Because the problem with placing a smart kid in each group is that all the students in that group recognize this, and they're gonna slip into those roles. So there are four roles that I'm using in my class. Resource manager, who manages materials, Recorder, reporter, which is pretty self-explanatory, and then facilitator and team captain. Facilitator is organizing the group, and the team captain is enforcing norms. So these are my beautiful classroom signs, and I know you might think norms are cheesy and roles aren't actually followed, and they're just something to hang on the wall, and they don't really do anything. But that's true. Really, these signs in and of themselves aren't going to transform my classroom. It's gonna come down to how I'm gonna introduce and support these norms and roles to students. It's gonna take a lot of intentional work and a shift in my own priorities, but I'm excited for the potential to turn my students into powerful problem solvers. So, you can wish me luck, or if you're interested in learning more, you can take on this goal with me. I'm starting a reading group this year to read the NCTM book, Strength in Numbers, which many of the ideas in this talk originated from. So if you liked anything you heard, you should come hang out with me and read this book. Thank you. All right, thank you, Julie, for getting us started. Okay, it's time for our first prize this evening. 
It is thought that within the church of operation managers in Washington, D.C., that the greatest sin is putting things on your walls that will not come down, using glue or tape or anything that you can't peel off at the end of the year. It's also thought the only way to address this issue is with a passive-aggressive all-staff email. And so oftentimes, <laughs> this is the suggestion, buy some poster putty, and yet it is never bought for teachers on the front end. So tonight, we have one lucky winner who's going to get four sets of these to put posters up in their classroom. Oh, Perhaps. Bill, can you, can you tell us the, the winning prize? You choose a number. Hey, all right. Congratulations. <laughs> all right. Our second talk, talk this evening is by Daniel from Alice Deal Middle School. Um, when we asked Daniel what his favorite su or his teacher superpower would be, he said the power to prevent dry erase markers from drying out. That sounds like the power to ask for a million dollars. Daniel's talk is titled Celebrating Mistakes. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and I'm just going to jump right into it. So uh, imagine that you're teaching some integer computation, and you give students the following problem. Give them some time to work it out, and then get a volunteer to share their answer. And this is what you get. Right? I'm sure we've all, we've seen, all seen this. What I want, what you, I want to you to do, do is, do is I want you to think, think. What is your reaction? reaction? What, do you, what do you say? What, what, what's your? body language look like. Now, let's switch it up. You're in eighth grade or teaching algebra or something, and you put up this on the board. You're working on slope. You give students the graph and say, hey, find the slope of this line. You give them some time to work it out. Have them write it down. You want them to share it out. You get a volunteer, and this is what they get. Again, think about what, what you do as a response to this. What do you say? What's your body language? I think that's really important, and what I want you to think about is what if you did this? Awesome! That's perfect! Talk to me about how you got that. And for the other one, <laughs> wonder. You clearly know a ton about slope already. Tell me how you got there. What I want to talk to you today about is celebrating mistakes and the, the message that sends our students about how you value what they're thinking. And I want to talk to you about how you build a classroom culture around that, as well as the importance with student understanding in celebrating those mistakes. At the beginning of the school year, I really like to tell my students that I, I really value their mistakes. Right? It's, it's a path to discovery. But you know, it's not just enough to tell them. I want to show them I value their mistakes. And there's lots of ways to do that, one of which is next to that star work you have, put best mistakes. After a mistake's made in class, the next day, make it a warm-up. Why is this such a great mistake? All right? I think that showing students the value helps you push their understanding. And I love this quote because isn't this true? Right? Aren't wrong answers more exciting to talk about than right ones? Now, I, I know that one of the biggest struggles that students have is they're afraid to make mistakes. They'd rather say, I don't know, than make that mistake. And so, I like to combat that with saying, I'm not asking you to tell me what you know. Tell me what you think. Let students know you value their thoughts. And that leads me into the understanding students gain from learning from those mistakes, right? Because if you celebrate those mistakes, the next step is to learn from them. Now, excuse me, uh, if you talk about celebrate mistakes and show them in work and in the classroom, right? students will be more willing to talk about those mistakes. And the idea of error analysis isn't foreign to us. I guarantee you've used it in your classroom. Why? Because you know students need a deeper understanding of the material to do an error analysis. 
it gives them more chance to dive deeply into the material. Now, I want to go back to that student mistake that we saw, excuse me, saw from the beginning, right? If you ask a student to explain what they're doing here, I'm sure you get a ton of responses, but this is one that I think you would get. They start explaining and they stop short and they say, ooh, I just made a simple mistake. I, I, I meant to say, I, I meant to say uh, uh, the negative 10. It's great, but don't let them get away with simple mistake. Mistake's mistake, they need to learn from it and celebrate it and then push back. Okay, well why is it not positive 10? Another scenario is they mix up the rules, right? We see this all the time. And just saying, oh, you know what? You just mix up the rule for multiplying integers and adding integers. Have a student come up, demonstrate. Okay, well, show me that this would work. And if they come up to the board, I think you would almost expect something like this to happen where they start trying to illustrate it and they stop short again and be like, wait, I don't understand. This doesn't work. The minute you get them asking why, you've got them hooked. Now, I want to talk about a concern I know that a lot of us have with celebrating mistakes. It's the time. And first, I want to say it's worth it. It really is. But more realistically, talking about mistakes and diving deep into them is so powerful that you need to plan for them. You know when mistakes are going to happen. You know what's coming, so plan for it. When a student makes that mistake, you have a slot in your lesson for it. Now, before I leave you, I want to say two things. One, these are two great resources that really have helped me with celebrating mistakes. And it's not just okay to, for students to make mistakes. We should celebrate them because the learning that comes out of it is tremendous. Thank you. All right, thank you, Daniel. Great high five midway through, too. My hand is still ringing from it. I would not do that in a classroom, though. That might hurt a little bit. Okay, our next prize is a top of the line set of sort of, uh, I don't know what the official name, like dry erase board inserts. And so if you were doing an activity, say we used something similar this week, we were doing midpoint formula and geometry that you can set up a graphic organizer, slide it in and do lots of dry erase uh, board work. A uh, great resource, you get a full set of 10, so you can get half of your class or a third of your class, depending on what school you're teaching at. Um, <laughs> Bill, can you choose a prize for us? Stay up here because you're presenting next. <laughs> All right. This is my wonderful colleague, Sean Trinetta Lee from E.L. Haynes Public Charter School. Um, when we asked Sean Trinetta what her superpower would be, it would be super distraction reflectors because my students always have off task questions that suck me in. And so, uh, deflectors to stay on task. Her talk is titled Advanced Quantitative Reasoning Life Preparation. Let's give a warm round of applause for Sean Trinetta. So advanced quantitative reasoning is a class that I'm teaching this year for the very first time. Um, and I feel like it is a life preparation course for our seniors that are getting ready to graduate and move on to the next level. So who doesn't ever have a student say, where am I going to use this math concept? Or why do we have to do math homework? Um, so anything that any student wants to do, we know that they're going to have to use some type of math for it. So the University of Texas at Austin has developed this, developed this wonderful course called Advanced Quantitative Reasoning. Um, and what this course is, is that it emphasizes statistics and financial applications um, in order to prepare students to use algebra, um, geometry, and other discrete models, discrete math models, um, to solve real life problems. So the course, um, help students to develop career and college skills by collaborating, conducting research, and making presentations. So the course only, um, as a prerequisite for the course, students have only had to have up to Algebra 2. It can also serve as an alternative to pre-calculus. 
And for students who want to go into careers that are not calculus heavy, um, this is the perfect course for them. Who wants to learn what the derivative of milk is? Why do we want to know it's cheese? So, um, uh, statistics. So, most of the statistics show that students are not really using pre-calculus. Um, that only a small percentage of students who take pre-calculus ever go on to calculus in college. I was one of those students at first, and then I changed my major. So some of the states that are adopting this wonderful course um, are North Carolina, Kentucky, Ohio, um, Texas, Washington State, and Wyoming, and now DC, because I am, I think, probably one of the few teachers in DC teaching it. And the course relates critical thinking. Um, I've, working, I've been working really hard to get our students to critically think, think about concepts and not just the actual steps of the problems that we're doing. And um, these are some of the ideas that we're covering this year. So we're talking about data analysis and um, topics in geometry, numbers everywhere, and um, using a focus on a number as measurements, metrics, um, and then these are some of the ideas or some of the projects that we'll be working on this year. So developing um, amortization schedules and talking about weather maps. Um, and then you'll see some other things that we've done thus far four weeks into school. So a lot of my students hate using large numbers. Um, so we really want to start them to get them to think about like using millions and billions. They always want to use hundreds and thousands. So one of the things that we did was we are estimating how many students are, I mean, how many people are in a crowd based off of um, using critical thinking methods, whereas we count how many pe people pass a certain mark in a certain amount of time. Um, so how many of your students can answer this question? How many sheep does it take to make a sweater for everyone in this country? My students can, and they were able to create a six-step um, presentation where they had to, oh, well here's the answer. <laughs> so think about how many, how many sheep um, it would take for you to count, count um, sheep to go to sleep. So 1.83752 billion sheep was the answer. And then some of the other things that we're doing, we're talking about tax rates this year. We're talking about um, tires and how we're changing tires um, on our cars and how that affects our odometer and speedometer. We're also going to do some um, medical case studies. So uh, I want my students to really be great decision makers. That's the whole point of this course, um, in addition to becoming better critical thinkers. And as I've been preparing for this course, these are some of the things that I have been thinking about. Um, how do I come up with a great research project at the end of this class? How do I differentiate instruction? Um, what are some things that I can do to help prepare better for this course? And these are my lovely students um, this week working together as they're working on calculating, um, I'm sorry, went blank. They're calculating how, the, how changing a tire versus a factory tire, how it affects your car and um, the mileage. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sean Jernetta. Um, our next, uh, on our last prize, we handed out some dry erase sheets, and I know a lot of you were really disappointed that you didn't win. And so I want to let you know that those are expensive and you don't want to go spend your own money. But what you should spend your money on are transparency sheets, the very cost-effective way to do this. So you can get 50 of them for cheaper, and now you can definitely cover at least one of your classes with dry erase sheets. They are great for slipping in and a super cheap alternative to what the education companies um, you, or sell or what we just handed out. So Bill, can you tell us our next prize here? All right, great. And for this winner, we're also throwing in a Carnegie Institution of Science coffee mug. Ah, I didn't see that excitement over this prize. All right, 
Our next presenter this evening is Michael Driscoll from Math for America. He's traveled down here from New York uh, to present with us this evening. Michael has been in the classroom and then has transitioned out and does a lot of the professional development work and outreach with uh, Math for America. Uh, when we asked him about his superpower, he said the ability to grade homework in a fraction of a second. Pretty impressive, but then how would you catch up on your Netflix? So, the nice superpower, but the bad excuse. All right, that one, that one bound a little bit. All right, Michael. Michael's talk is called, I've got it here. Will the real policymakers please stand up? Let's give a warm round of applause for Mike. Before I hit start, I wanted to say thank you for having me. And uh, I taught for 10 years in New York City, and I have so much respect for what you all do. So it was a real honor to get to stand up here with a bunch of teachers and give a talk who are still in the classroom. So I'd like to start with a question. Why is it so hard to implement education policy? Take the Common Core, for example, which were carefully crafted standards, and yet we've struggled mightily to implement them in the classroom. And when that happens, we play the blame game. Is it the policymakers' fault? Is it the teachers' fault? Is it the policy's fault? And in doing so, we miss the fundamental reason why education reform fails to take hold. And the real issue is that we think about policy as something that we need to do to teachers rather than something that we must do with teachers. And so reform only travels in one direction, from policy to practice. But the education system in this country is really complicated. And any policy, no matter how well crafted, is going to run into complicated classroom level uh, challenges and solutions. And we're going to need expert teachers to figure that out, teachers that know their subject, that know their pedagogy, and understand the students in front of them. And so the central problem is, how can these classroom level challenges and their solutions inform policy? And there's two pieces to this. First, those challenges and the solutions have to be made visible to policymakers. And second, the policymakers have to do something with it. So I want to tell you two stories, one about how master teacher programs are a natural way to bring those challenges and the solutions to the surface. And second, a story about a master teacher program where policy leaders are actually using the information to drive reform in the system. So at MFA in New York, we're going to have uh, hundreds of teachers who are going to participate in more than 34 professional learning teams in the fall, or groups of teachers who meet regularly to learn from their practice. And these PLTs at MFA focus on shared professional challenges. They're proposed and led by the master teachers themselves. And because teachers come from all around the city, they reflect the wide variety of uh, realities in terms of those challenges that are facing teachers in the city. So here are three examples. These are real PLTs that are going to be offered in the fall. And I'm going to let you read the course descriptions, which were written by the teachers that uh, uh, are leading them. But I'm only going to give you 15 seconds per description, so you're going to have to read quick. So what are the takeaways for policymakers? Well, substantial challenges exist in implementing the, the Common Core, but expert teachers can make those challenges and their solutions visible. And the key there is a community that's centered on collaborative, high-level professional work. Two years ago, the New York State Master Teacher Program was founded uh, with public money based on the model at Math for America. And uh, leaders at the state level, the district level, and the school level have taken the work that the teachers are doing, and they're using it to guide system-wide level change. So master teachers in New York State are serving on high-level planning committees. They're facilitating district-wide pro professional development. They're partnering with education department faculty. They're mentoring and coaching pre-service teachers. They're leading school-based professional development and more. And what we found is that even a small number of teachers can have ideas that have a big impact. 
So if there are policymakers in the audience tonight, I would suggest that you be thinking about ways you can work with MFA in DC. And so I want to summarize that maybe a better way to think about uh, practice-driven policy is to think about the ways that expert teachers can make those classroom-level challenges visible, and those, that visible uh, set of challenges can inform the implementation strategies. Are there easier ways to do this? Well, a few weeks ago, Larry Cuban wrote about the fact that teachers are the last ones who see policy before it meets their students. So they are, in a real sense, policy makers. And he pointed to research that shows when we lock policy uh, uh, teachers out of the policy making uh, circle, that we get results that we don't necessarily want. We get policies where we try to make people teach in similar ways, and we end up with everybody teaching in different ways. And so I want to conclude with an expanded vision for how we think about policymakers and how we think about the way that we do policy, one where reform is uh, centered on experts, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Thank you. All right. I don't think I ever want to see my face that big again. Uh, thank you, Michael. All right, we have one more outstanding prize. Many, some of you have this, some of you don't. Always a great addition to the classroom, a number line. Negative 20 to 120, those are the only integers in the world, and so you will cover them all. <laughs> Bill, can you choose us a, a victor? Uh, 715-029. Oh, yeah. got it. All right. Congratulations. All right. One of our general policies here at MFA is that whenever we get math teachers together to do a professional development, we need to do some math. And so this is our math interlude portion of the evening. So um, Bill Day, one of our master teachers and a teacher, um, I'm sorry, a um, teacher at Two Rivers Public Charter School is going to lead us through an AMC question. I will let him uh, talk you through it and introduce you to it. When I asked Bill what his teaching superpower would be, he would say to take a stack of student papers and instantly do item analysis, uh, which X would be x-ray vision. vision. Excellent. All right, take it away. Okay, my uh, esteemed colleague uh, Bianca Abrams is handing out little snippets of, uh, of this problem. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to try to uh, give you this problem, give you some time to think about this problem, and then we'd love to get a variety of approaches, solutions to this uh, problem about Margie's winning uh, design. Okay, so let's take a few minutes, look at this problem, read it over, and give it your best shot. For those of you quick thinkers, there's also a question of what if the pattern had continued uh, to 100 circles, what would the percentage uh, move to? Okay, guys, uh, turn to somebody next to you, start talking about what your approaches are to this problem. Um, and we're going to be looking for a few brave uh, souls that might be willing to share their approach, at least, if not their final solution, um, on some chart paper here. So uh, if you're willing, or you can nudge somebody next to you to be willing, uh, raise your hand and, and we'll get you making a poster. Okay. Glad to, to see and hear all this uh, talk amongst our mathematical minds. The discourse in here is very rich. Um, I'm going to open the floor to uh, anybody who has either an approach or a, uh, a solution that they think is worthy of sharing. And uh, my lovely uh, colleague Will here will uh, try and transcribe some ideas that we get down. I may have picked a more involved problem. Or do we have, we have one potential solution? I, I don't have a final solution, but I have a, a, a methodology. 
Come on up. Come, let's, let's thank this brave soul here. Jeff, uh, what school do you teach at, Jeff? Or what do you... <laughs> oh, really? Oh, that sounds like a great school. didn't have to use pi in there because it's just a ratio. Yeah, just a pi ratio. is going to be a part of the, yeah. the whole. And so then the question becomes, well, what's, what are the arcs, or you know, I don't know the name that shape, that, you know, because this block area isn't a whole circle, right? It's that minus the inside. Well, the difference of successive squares are just the odd number. So the area of the first, if we call the area of the first one, one, the, the first black circle, oh, then the leftover area here is going to be three, five, seven, nine, and then whatever, the next one, 11. <laughs> so then the, the, and so then the area of the black shaded area becomes one, uh, 
1 plus 3 plus, no, sorry, 1 plus 5 plus 9 over 36. And then that gives you a way to do, you know, n, n, yeah. I love problem solving, by the way. <laughs> I, I never would have thought of that method by myself, and I, I do believe that it is uh, a fruitful way of, of getting to that answer. Are there any other methods? It's probably just as well. I'm way past my five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. OK. Uh, one of the worst things about doing presentations with math teachers is that when you get a problem, you want to keep working. And so I need you to put your pencils down and stop working on that problem and just take that as fact that we have solved it twice uh, so we can go on to our next presenters. Um, our next presenter is not with us this evening, and so we have a virtual presentation. Um, our next presenter is a, a dear friend of MFA DC, James Tanton. James Tanton is also heavily involved with, he works for the Mathematical Association of America and puts out a lot of work around AMC problems and how to get students to solve these tough types of problems. Uh, when we asked James uh, what his superpower would be, James said to, to supply all student teacher, administrator, curriculum writer, assessment maker, the pressing desire, the ability, the time, and the mental space to always pause and mull and act on the question, so what is really going on here? And James would have said it in an Australian accent and would have sounded much cooler. And so to sound, to hear what he has to say, here is his video uh, presented to us virtually. Um, is there a way to, to dim the lights? Are we, uh, we'll go, just make it a movie in here. If not, that's fine too. Oh, all right. Oh, all right. Good day. I was recently asked, what are some of the reasons for your success as a teacher? And I sat down to try to give a serious answer to this question. But I first need to point out that I disagree with the premise of the question, a successful teacher. People will be shocked to learn that I always arrange the tables in my classes and workshops so that everyone is facing the board. I lecture, I only lecture, and always focus on the teacher in the room. I use the board extensively, and there's absolutely no technology anywhere in sight as I teach. And I don't do anything innovative in the classroom. Seriously, zero, zip, zilch on the innovation front. So this ego-full, self-focused piece is my attempt to answer the question as to why some people seem to think I am a successful teacher despite all this. Forgive me for this talk. Just to show how blatantly self-focused this talk is, here are some pictures of me. I'm James Tatton, by the way. Success number one, I have an accent. I'm serious, and I think this is a big part of my success in the classroom. My accent seems to be extremely pleasing to the American ear, and I'm fully aware that it works to my full advantage in my American life. Success number two. I treat everyone like adults, even kids. I always assume everyone just does the right thing. Well, I need to qualify that. We're all human, and I know we make silly mistakes when under stress and pressure, and so I slip on doing the right thing every now and then. But that is the learning process for all this. One needs to slip to truly understand the importance of not slipping. So I assume people just do the right thing, and if they don't, they'll learn from the goof and just not do it again. Even if students do slip, there's an emotion that accompanies that wrongdoing, one that sits and lingers. Contending with that emotion is the learning experience. Plus, students, by and large, do do the right thing. Success number three. I'm quirky and I like to play with ideas. Being quirky is important. When learning about permutations, for example, I'd like to rearrange the letters of the word cheesiestness, the quality of being the cheesiest of all the cheeses. I love squine and cosquine. I love to ask how many degrees there are in a Martian circle. And I love quirky words from the history of math. Vinculum, obelisk, radix, and so on. Success number four. I think hard about what's really going on and why anyone cares. I think I'm good at thinking deeply about stuff and can cut through all the usual surrounding clutter. That's why my lecture style works. I let go of unnecessary jargon and clutter. Plus I do the quirky, straight to the heart of the matter lectures. Exploding dots is a prime example. Success number five. I break every 37 and a half minutes. I once read a paper early in my career that said that the average attention span of an audience member sitting through a lecture style presentation is 37 and a half minutes. And I've taken that as a literal fact and made it a universal law in my teaching. I tell this little story at the start of my courses and workshops and we religiously have a break at the 37 and a half minute mark, even if it's only a 45 minute class. Success number six. I know some history of math. I want math to be the human story that it is. I share the tales and the backs and forths of the struggles of de developing the ideas we see and use today. They're usually far from natural and obvious to the human mind, and so shouldn't be portrayed as such. Success number seven. I'm not at all afraid to make mistakes, even whoppers of once. It is a vital and genuine part of math to be human in your relationship with it. I don't need to be seen as the expert, but I do need to model for my students what it means to engage with mathematics as a human being. I want to model how to learn and how to figure things out. Success number eight. 
I seem to be good at helping people feel it is okay not to know. After all, I know very little myself. The message I give is that it's completely okay not to know something, but it's not okay not to want to find out. And the more you know, the less you know. As one's mathematical sophistication grows, one starts to see formal concepts in a new light. Subtleties and hidden assumptions become clear, and previously comfortable topics become uncomfortable and shaky. The idea that, for example, by the end of middle school, students should be comfortable with fractions is ludicrous to me. Fractions are actually very hard, and a thinking high school student really should revisit them and be uncomfortable with them. Success number nine. I think I'm good at recognizing hazy thinking. We all know hazy thinking when we personally experience it. Even though you think you've got it, that hazy feeling tells you that the subject is deeper and more subtle than you first thought. Hazy thinking is a call to pause. I've given the following homework to my students. Go for a 20 minute walk and don't think about this problem. Seriously, I have. Success number 10. I incorporate in my courses moments of looking back as part of pushing forward. Think of your university abstract algebra course, for example. There you listed the group axioms, the ring axioms, the field axioms, and explored the logical consequences long and hard. But did you learn there how to explain why negative and negative is positive, why dividing by zero is problematic, the value of zero to the zero? The same is true for your high school students. Topics can be abstract and one needs to reflect back. Success number 11. It is okay to have emotions when doing math. My first step in problem solving is acknowledge your emotional reaction. Truly. Next, take a deep breath and just try something and get forward with the problem. Success number 12. I'm not assessed, obsessed about assessment. I just want students to prove to me that they get it in the end. If it takes a while before they do and grades are lousy during that period, no worries. Get it in the end and we can ignore, and we can ignore all that. This notion seems to be an anathema in the high school world, of all places. So that's it. 12 embarrassingly ego-filled points about me and my teaching. Thanks so much. We are going to send James a big thank you uh, and appreciation for this video. Uh, like this video and all the videos from tonight, they're being recorded by these fancy cameras on the side of the room. And so if you have a colleague who couldn't make it here tonight, uh, we'll be able to send this video out to them so they can have it and have access to that. All right, our next presenter is Nalani Davis. Nalani is a master teacher with Math for America, and she teaches at Eastern Senior High School. And Nolani, I'm going to put you on the spot as you walk up here. You need to tell us what your teaching superpower is. We're going to give you a warm round of applause while you think about it on the way up. I also forgot to give out our next prize on the theme of mistakes. Another set of dry erase boards, this one with a coordinate grid already placed on it. I don't know, so you get a set of 10 of these on the back. There's lots of good stuff. And this person is also going to take home a Carnegie Institution of Science mug. We got a number here, 0510. Hey! All right, go. Nice. Check out the ticket. Hi, everyone. Um, so my math superpower would be the ability to read students' minds. So when they say, oh, I get it, I can really read their mind and see if they're telling the truth. Okay. Just press the Okay. Good evening, math educators and friends. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight I'll be sharing with you a lesson that I worked on over the summer. Before we begin, I wanna to pause to give everyone a moment to look closely at the two screenshots that are about to appear on the screen. What do they have in common? Both show activities that are aligned to the same ninth grade common core standard, but one is a full project rich with data collection Full, sorry, a full project rich with data collection technology and world applications while the other is a worksheet. Which experience would be richer for students? From this question, the Cornerstone Project was born. Over the summer, a team of DCPS teachers gathered to craft performance tasks for each grade and subject that every student would have access to in the district regardless of the school they attended. 
I work with the secondary math team on Cornerstone for Algebra 1. Initially, I wasn't sure which topic I would work on or what would be the best way to kind of get this project done, considering that I'm working on a project that's meant to meet the needs of many diverse learners. So, after going through Common Core Standards for Algebra 1, the phrase linear functions appeared an astonishing 68 times. <laughs> So not only that, the seeds of linear and algebraic thinking appear, um, they begin appearing in the Common Core standards as early as grade five, with similar standards around pattern recognition um, and just function identification as early as in kindergarten. So what better topic to dive into than linear functions, um, considering the significance of this concept throughout students' K-12 career? So behind you guys now, I have some of the slides from, uh, or some of the materials from the project. Um, so the name of the project is Leap of Faith. So this project is adapted from an already existing project entitled Barbie Bungee Jump. But my goal in reconstructing the materials was to make the materials more accessible and friendly for students and then also um, very implementable for teachers. So um, students, are tasked with, uh, students are tasked with the goal of uh, making a bungee jump, a bungee jump cord for a Barbie doll. Um, they're the owners of a, Barbie jump co of a bungee jump company. Um, so as the project opens, um, the students get all the materials that they need. They get rubber bands, they get a meter stick, they get a Barbie, and they start in the classroom, and they begin just by dropping the Barbie off um, from the, they, so they hold the Barbie up and then they drop it off the wall. So they will gradually increase the length of the bungee jump cord um, by rubber bands, and then they'll graph the data, um, and they also will graph the data of items um, of like a different weight and size, so they also could use like a, like a stuffed animal or stapler or really anything in the classroom. Um, and then from there, they'll start to kind of develop their own um, idea of what's happening. As they add rubber bands to the bungee jump cord, what happens to the Barbie doll? Um, so then from this, they'll create a scatter plot, um, a line of best fit, a regression line using a TI-84 calculator, um, and then they also will answer probably over about 20 reflection questions along the way. Um, so there also is a lot of thinking and writing involved in this as well. So this project is also meant to make teachers' lives easier. So it's a full package. It comes with um, a PowerPoint, student handouts, student reflections, do nows, um, exit cards, um, power, uh, I think I said PowerPoint already, um, less, a full lesson plan, a rubric, a full instructional outline. So really it's a complete package ready to go for teachers. Um, so, Okay, sorry. So I really, really love this activity because um, it doesn't, you know, it really combines not just one or two of the mathematical practice standards, but really all of them. And it does it in an organic way that really does excite students and provide them with a memorable, a memorable um, hands-on task and learning experience. So this activity is meant to contextualize the topic of linear functions, which again, like we said, is going to be one of those really um, important ones that students are going to see from kindergarten really on the college math. Um, it not only supports a majority, of, a majority of the Algebra I curriculum, but it also gives students the chance to imagine, explore, um, collaborate, grapple, move, um, and just get excited about math. And at the end of the day, that really is one of our goals. That actually is probably all of our goals as math teachers. Um, in closing, this activity is fun, it's a great activity, but you know, of course, this activity can't be every day, um, and every day can't have the same bells and whistles as this project has. Um, one thing to note is that activities like this require time, materials, resources, money, and PD. So um, we definitely have a long way to go, but it also, you know, I believe it's our goal as math educators to figure out how can we take the same excitement um, of a project like this and make it something that, that can be uh, repl replicable every single day in the classroom. And that is it. All right, thank you, Nalani. Um, there is no way to show your colleagues that you love math from your head to your toes than by literally wearing math on your toes. Yes, our next prize, a set of male and female socks. Male socks here, uh, female socks here. These are great for any occasion, any occasion, except I think when you're practicing the park test. There's a section that says you cannot wear these uh, on test days. So make sure you read your park proctoring manual. Uh, Bill, we need a male winner and a female winner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, zero, three, one. Oh. 
All right. And then our next one. Choose a female one, please. Certainly a female one. Zero, three, three. Yes! Oh, <laughs> amazing. All right. Okay, our next speaker this evening is Belinda Thompson. Belinda is coming to us from LearnZillion, a website that if you have not checked out, you're definitely going to want to check out with a ton of great resources. Also, always a good plug founded by a former member of our staff at E.L. Haynes Public Charter School. Uh, so we're glad to have Belinda here. Belinda, when asked about her superpower, she would say it would be the power to ask students the right question based on their thinking. Let's give a warm round of applause for Belinda, whose talk is in praise of wrong answers. All right, so my talk could just as easily have been titled in praise of all my former students who have given me lots of wrong answers because they have really enabled me to um, learn from the wrong answers that they've given. And why would we want to do this? Uh, students don't set out to make mistakes. They want to do the right thing. They're trying to do the right thing, get a good grade. But I can learn uh, from looking at their answers and I learn a little bit about eliciting wrong answers that help me. So students think two things can happen when they give an answer. They could give a right answer or they could give a wrong answer. But I would argue that the opposite of a right answer is not a wrong answer. The opposite of a <laughs> is no answer. So I can learn from students who give right answers and wrong answers, but I can't learn if they don't give me any answer at all. So I'm gonna think about what I can learn from any answer, but I have to see that answer first. So I'm gonna talk a little bit later about a quick way to get an answer. So I don't wanna um, I don't want to say that right answers are not important. Of course they are important, but I like to think about how there were lots of wrong answers that finally led to these right answers. It turns out that research actually tells us wrong answers are good for us. Uh, Carol Dweck's work on that has a uh, growth mindset is uh, telling us that your brain can actually grow when you give a wrong answer and that that message for students really helps them. Uh, I would also argue that wrong answers are good for math. The mathematical practices have some opportunities for wrong answers built in. If I um, am modeling a situation and making a prediction, um, my prediction may not pan out. Um, also in mathematical practice three, if I want to make a claim and defend it, I might find a hole in that claim. So that wrong answer could help me think about something more deeply. And I also want to think about if I critique the reasoning of others, I'm actively looking for someone, a wrong answer, and not just believing a claim that someone makes. So if these are good, uh, wrong answers are good, how do I maximize that goodness? One of the things I can do, which we've heard before uh, tonight, is that you can prepare in advance for wrong answers. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about asking questions with constrained or limited wrong answer um, potential so that I can ask myself what's really going on here. Um, and this really is great free PD that you can engage in every day. You ask your students questions every day. You collect their homework. You give them a quiz. There are lots of wrong answers coming in. So let's take advantage of that and harness it. So if I ask a simple question like this, simplify this expression, or use the order of operations, I, would, um, I like tiny questions like this because there's a constrained number of wrong answers that I see. I'm going to see lots of nines, negative 21s, fives, some other miscalculations. But when I look at my students' work, I think about what is really going on here? What's the message that I've been giving? Is order of operations something that we just need to remember? Or am I giving them the idea that um, a numerical expression only has one value? So we should all agree on that value. And in order to do that, we work with a standard order of operations. Another question that we've asked in a research project with community college students is why does x plus 1 equals x um, have no solutions? And in our survey, 17% of the students tried to do some mechanics and then got kind of stumped. 
And 68% of the respondents gave some kind of explanation, um, like well, we don't know what X is, or X can only be <laughs> on one side. So they were appealing to some rules. And 15% of the students gave some kind of answer about reasoning about equations. So what this tells me is, when I see wrong answers <laughs> about this equation, is what do students really think they're doing when they're solving equations? And this simple question gave us a lot of information, um, and we had lots of great answers. Lots of great wrong answers. <laughs> so what could you do? Work out the problems yourself. I like to carry around a clipboard with my predictions on it so that I can put some other predictions on there. Also usually have some questions that I wanna ask students that I see that work um, with. After class, I usually make piles of these wrong answers to try to figure out what's going on in this pile. Um, and I like to also share them with friends and say, what do you think this student um, is doing? There's also a great website, mathmistakes.org, where you can share wrong answers. So why should we heart wrong answers? Well, research says it's good to make them. Uh, it's good mathematical practice to look for them and learn from them, and it's daily free PD. And I really encourage you to look deeply at your students' wrong answers. It could be a turning point for you. All right, thank you, Belinda. Uh, like a fireworks show, we are gonna give out a lot more prizes right now. Almost everyone's gonna win, I think. Uh, so our first one is a file organizer. Um, there's nothing else to be said. Yo, let's choose a, choose a winner here. Congrats. Okay, our next prize, uh, you are two weeks, most of us are one to two weeks in the school year, so there's a 95% chance your copier has broken down when you've needed copies. So you're getting a stamp and ink pad of the coordinate plane so that when it breaks, you can stamp a worksheet and still be prepared. So who's our next winner here? Zero, five, two. All right. Our next winner, I don't have a slide for this, but this is the top of the line math box. If you haven't had one of these before, they are wonderful. There's no greater stage in my teaching career than when I had students engaging in deep mathematical thought about this expression right here and then leaving and said, I guess we'll learn what the number is later in the year. Not knowing it's at 8 o'clock. <laughs> you good one, I have a lot to go. So another prize here. Batting cleanup for us tonight is Jeff from Two Rivers, who we've already heard from this evening. When we asked Jeff what his superpower would be, he said, my teacher's superpower would be time manipulation, the ability to slow time down and extend lessons when rich discussions are getting started. Let's give a warm round of applause for Jeff. His talk is titled, Guarantee the Grapple, Planning for Rich Problem Solving Tests. All right, awesome, thanks guys. Um, so I am from Two Rivers Public Charter School and um, we are a preschool through eighth grade in Northeast DC and uh, my talk is to give you a little taste of some workshops that we're gonna give later uh, this year called Learning and Loving Math. So if you're interested, jump in and uh, hopefully it gives you a sense of uh, some of the things that Nolani was talking about. Um, but I want to start by talking about proficiency. So uh, our vision of proficiency has changed with the Common Core standards and, um, and, and it's embraced a full vision that doesn't just include 
procedural fluency, or even just conceptual understanding, but also the problem-solving skills of strategic competence and adaptive reasoning, as well as an ability to uh, have a productive disposition towards mathematics. And that means that we need to change the way that we are teaching mathematics um, to embrace that full definition. Um, problems that kids are at actively engaged in need to be truly problematic. Um, they need to help develop understanding of the underlying math, and uh, they, we need to give all students access to that math and opportunities to explain their reasoning. So I'm gonna talk about a three-part lesson format that's pretty simple. It's got a before, a during, and after problem solving um, that we use, and I feel like it's really key to that, that, those cornerstone projects as well. Um, and so I'm gonna go through each of those very briefly, but in the before portion, I think the key piece here is that you want kids to understand the mathematics and you wanna take everything else off of the table. So you really want them engaged in mathematics and not in figuring out what pizza toppings they're gonna to have to figure out the fractions, right? Um, and the second piece is the during problem solving. And this is the uh, step to step back, but it doesn't mean that you don't disengage. You have to be totally engaged with the kids as you step back um, from helping them solve the problems. And then the third component is the after portion, and this is a part though I feel like a lot of teachers just leave off, but how do you leave time um, at the end for kids to synthesize their learning and to share and debrief, as we like to call it. So I'm gonna talk about six steps now to thinking about how do you actually create lessons like this. Um, we're gonna start with the first point, which is about begin with the mathematics. Obviously, we know the standards. Start with the standards, but I also find that it's more important to, to go back and read the, uh, some mathematics books, do some research on the web. Even though I may have taught linear algebra for a number of years, I always find that it is useful to go back to the text that I have to refresh my ideas and my own understanding of the concepts. Second, you wanna start thinking about your students. What do they care about? What do they know mathematically? But also, what do they love? Is it Barbie dolls jumping off of a, a bungee cord, which is pretty awesome? And then think about the task. You wanna keep it simple. So one size doesn't fit all. Um, that's why we don't have a curriculum that has all of the best problems in the world. You need to start to look for those problems, though, and then think about how they adapt and work with your kids. So with that in mind, you wanna think about the curriculum first, and then you wanna add and think about your students and then last but not least, think about the context in which this problem is going to be situated. And then the perfect problem is going to sit in uh, those three concentric circles together. And then after you have that problem, you're going to predict what happens. And to do that, you need to work the mathematics. Just like I tell teachers that uh, are primarily responsible for teaching reading, read the book. When you're teaching math, do the math before you give it to kids. Um, the next step before actually getting into planning the problem is to think about uh, the logistics of the problem. How are kids going to get engaged in this problem? What are your expectations for an exemplary piece of work? And how are you going to get them to get there? And then you start to plan each of those pieces. Think about the before part of the lesson. How are you going to make sure that everything is off the table except the mathematics? And how are you going to make sure that every kid really understands the problems that they're engaged in? Second, you're going to start to think about the during portion. And you really do need to plan this part. What are the hints that you can give kids that are gonna keep them engaged in the mathematics that you want them to work on, but then takes off the table the, all of the other pieces and keeps them engaged and excited about the mathematics? Last but not least, consider how you're going to plan for class discussion at the end. How are you gonna have kids synthesize their learning and do what we call a share and debrief? You need to save like 10 to 15 minutes at the end of every class to make sure that that really happens and keep that time sacred. So I'm going to leave you with uh, three key ideas. Proficiency is more than memorizing algorithms and developing efficiency. Lessons built around problem-based tasks guarantee the grapple for all students. And you must be thoughtful and relentless in your effort to find these problems. So let's keep these, uh, this work in, uh, in this conversation going. So you can follow me on Twitter and, um, and then email me. And then also join us for those learning and loving math workshops. The first one's October 2nd. And we'd love to see you with us. Thanks, guys. did forget one prize, a set of four posters. I don't, another wonderful prize. So, Bill, could you choose our very last one here? Zero, six, two. We got one, we got one. All right.
All right, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. We have just uh, two plugs that I want to give before we wrap up. The first is a big thank you to everyone that um, helped put this night together. So a big thank you to the Carnegie Institution uh, for letting us use their space. A big uh, thank you to Pro AVDC, our tech guys who have done a great job and been incredibly uh, flexible with us as we got this ready. John Strom for videotaping and helping us put that together. Uh, Bianca Abrams for her leadership of MFA DC and all the work that she's done to put this together. And then one more big round of applause for all of our presenters tonight who did a wonderful job. Okay. Uh, we have two plugs tonight. The first is a movie plug. Uh, there is a movie that is being screened at the Gallery Place Theaters on September 17th called Sense. It is, my understanding, it's an underdog story about a middle school uh, girl who's been bullied a bit and is using math and problem solving and, and reasoning to make some money and start... Um, intriguing uh, and Paul uh, here from MFADC is going to be someone you can talk to about this they're looking for more people to bring students to this presentation and you've got a or to the screening you got to order by September 9th so there are flyers out uh, in the lobby by the cookies where we are going to network a bit uh, and you can meet some of the presenters and other colleagues who have come out tonight and then the second is just a, a broad invitation from MFADC we run uh, we're a collection of math teachers here in DC we run professional developments throughout the year um, on weeknights and on Saturdays Saturdays and different professional learning communities that we're all trying to get better at our craft and talking about ideas like we talked about tonight and continuing to know that we all have a long way to go as educators is the way that we start making that journey. And so we encourage you to reach out, to be involved, to invite your colleagues and to continue this conversation. We also encourage you, we have uh, Julia's work here of our three Math Ignites. Thank you for coming for this third one. And I, if you are interested and you're excited tonight and you wanna both come to the fourth one and also present, please send me an email. Um, and get involved the, the, after Math Ignite 1, the way we got speakers for Math Ignite 2 and 3 was by people reaching out and being excited and sharing what they're doing. By no means you need to be an expert, we just need you to be reflective and share that reflections with us. Thank you guys again. We are all head to the lobby for some cookies and have a great evening.